Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines in partnership with Green Hills Christian Fellowship Ortigas bring you a message from the Word of God. Together, let us know Christ and make Him known. Good morning, church family. Good morning. This morning, I woke up with a prayer in my heart, which is for God to allow me to worship Him this Sunday, that He may put His Spirit in me, wiping away all my concerns, my anxiety, my hindrances, to just allow me to be worshipful. Sometimes I have prayers like these when I feel doubtful, when I feel burdened, when I feel distraught. But you know what, church? He answered my prayer even before I have prayed it. Because He has redeemed me, He has forgiven me, sealed me in His Spirit, and brought me to His fellowship. And that applies to all of us who are His children. And that is why it invites us in Psalm chapter 95, verses 1 to 3. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. It's time for us to read scripture. May I just remind all of you who are here that this is the inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God. And it is a singular privilege for all of us to be reading from it, drinking from it, learning from it. And may we always regard this time of Scripture reading with the reverence that it deserves. With that said, open your Bibles to Romans 15, and we will be reading verses 1 through 7. And may I ask you to please rise to honor the Word of God. Romans 15, verses 1 through 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. This is the word of the Lord. Receive it in your hearts and minds. You may be seated. We continue in our series, our Clear the Air series, Burning Issues Confronting Christians Today. And the topic that we will discuss this morning is the blessings of being one with one another. The blessings of being one with one another. We will do something a little new today. We will begin the study of the Word with a reflection from one of our church workers. Mr. Chico Barreto, he is going to speak and give a reflection on his own experience about the blessings of being one with one another. <clears throat> and before he comes here to share his reflection, let's bow down our heads and pray. Lord, we ask 
that if there is anything that we can't see, that you might open our eyes to see it. If there is anything that we can't understand, that you might illumine our minds to receive it. If there is anything that we are stubborn to reject, we pray that you might open our hearts to accept it. And in so doing, Father, may we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ with our lives and our obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Psalm 133, verses 1 to 3, the Bible says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. With that, please welcome our communications head, Mr. Chico Barreto. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor BJ. Yes, indeed, as Psalm 133 says, it is good and pleasant when brothers dwell in unity. It is our prayer this morning that the inerrant, infallible, and ever-relevant Word of God be the one to speak to our hearts and our minds today. May the Lord lead us to obey and live out the truths that we will learn from today's passage in Romans 15. Let me begin by sharing with you a short reflection about today's passage. For those who know me, even uh, if I may seem friendly or easy to approach, I did not have the easiest time relating with other people, especially growing up in church. It wasn't a walk in the park for me. I did not see the point in bothering myself with other people's problems when they'd open up to me. I did not even see the need to be shepherded well by a pastor who is faithful to scripture. I was happy to volunteer though for whatever was needed and I gladly took on leadership roles and found deep fulfillment in the honor and prestige that comes with being a leader. At that time, I could honestly care less about the welfare and well-being of other people I was only looking out for myself. As long as I got the job done, I was good. God knew that my heart wasn't filled with love and compassion for others as I served in ministry. It took an almost church split and an uprooting from my home church for God to wake me up to repent from my sin of apathy and bitterness brought about as well by the many unresolved problems when God led me to move church. My family and I carefully and prayerfully sought God's wisdom for our next steps to find a new church, a place where God's word is preached faithfully, a spiritual community that loves one another, a place that we can call home. After a few months of searching, God led my family and I to plant our roots here in GCF Artigas exactly seven months before the pandemic's first lockdown. Coming from a mega church, I personally did not want to join another big church. I wanted to stay anonymous. I didn't want to hear other people's problems. I didn't want to deal with pastors or church leadership. My church wounds were fresh and I did not know how to heal. Despite all these and throughout these trying times, God in His mercy kept giving my family and I the desire to be part of a local church, to be shepherded by a pastor faithful to Scripture, to find our new church family. I wanted to belong, and I desperately needed encouragement at that time. It was during the first few months of the lockdown that God sovereignly introduced me to more and more people here in GCF. 
It didn't take long before I finished my membership class with Pastor Dags, whom I've known since college and was affirmed to be a covenant member of GCF Ortigas. I got to meet various circles among pastors, the youth, young adults, and of course, even the ates and titas in the women's ministry. With much prayer and of course, dying to self, God called me to serve in the worship ministry as the creative production consultant, and eventually later on to head our communications ministry. By God's grace, I've been working alongside our pastors and other ministry heads to pivot during this pandemic. But it wasn't on the last year that I felt a deep need for community among people my age. God helped me to reach out and I asked Pastor Larry and the rest of the pastors if I could serve in the young adults ministry. You know, I was thinking at the time, if someone like me who already works for the church feels the need to belong to a spiritual community with roots dug down deep, I wonder, how much more those who are not connected to any other believer at all. I said, maybe, you know, we could have a regular Bible study where anyone could come listen to the word of God and fellowship with one another. I did not know where to start or how to start it, but uh, I just shared what was in my heart. I approached, I took the first step, and uh, I spoke to our pastors and other GCFers around me. Until one seemingly random Friday, one of my teammates in the comms ministry told me that he'll be playing badminton with a fellow staff member, uh, Sataas, um, in the court upstairs. I asked them if I could join, and then, of course, they willingly agreed. So, with blue jeans and no practice at all, we played a few rounds of badminton. We really enjoyed that time and thought, next week, ulit, let's invite other people to join us. So, from what started as a seemingly random badminton game, we now regularly meet every Friday with an average of around 30 other young adults to fellowship with one another around God's Word. <laughs> around some sports, some food, of course, di mawawala yun, and a lot of coffee afterwards. It's just been six months and it's just so surreal to see this community grow in number and in love for God and one another. Just uh, two nights ago, with tears and joy, uh, tears of joy and tears of pain, we prayed for one another deeply in our breakout group. For those who don't know, it may be called young adults, but we're now a community of early 20s to late 30s and, of course, above. By God's grace, we're currently preparing to officially relaunch the ministry very, very soon. Much more can be done to welcome all singles, all young professionals, all Gen X, millennials, and the older Gen Z into the community. But this is a start. If you need a place to call home, you're more than welcome to join us. If God is prompting you to reach out to this age group, feel free to get connected with us every Friday as well. You know, I know this unfinished story may seem like a success, and it well may be an isolated case of good news uh, uh, compared to the, all the good news in our bigger church family. But I know firsthand that this may not be the case for everyone here. As the communications ministry head, I've been given the opportunity to get connected with various people in and out of the ministry, from elders, deacons, ministry servant volunteers of different ages, to several growth groups from the seniors, the men's, women's, couples ministries, to kids and youth alike. To be able to understand our church family better, I listened intently and observed things unspoken. And with God's help and wisdom, allow me to share some of my reflections over the past few years. Let me speak to my fellow GCF members and fellow GCF attendees. The past three years have been very uncomfortable for us. Let's be honest. We've had our fair share of differences with one another. There have been many disagreements that led to frustration, anger, unforgiveness, and then bitterness. In the past three years, we've been in disagreements and even debates over issues of political, medical, 
and even theological opinions. But our differences go beyond these hot topics. Truth be told, it is normal for a GC effort to keep things nice and pleasant on the outside. But on the inside, grievances and negative emotions abound. We'd rather tell other people what we think should have been done by that other person and unknowingly become a marites under the guise of, let's pray for that person, pag pray na lang natin yun. Instead of obeying what the Bible says about lovingly confronting the other person. Church family, we sweep things under the rug. We build an unseen wall between us and those with differing views. Sometimes it's with our leaders and pastors. At times, it's our GG mates. Some of us feel we are too young, too fragile to speak up. Our voices may not be heard. Some of us think, ah, you know, even if I tell him where he went wrong, he will just do the same thing over and over again. Alam na niya, pero wala. Ganun talaga siya. And some of us are resigned to the thought of, they already know what I'm going to say, so why will I say it pa? These differences between us are years and some even decades in the making. A thousand new mornings have come, but we still face these giant elephants in our own room. A lot of us, some of us, may have left. Some of us are on the fence of leaving, but a lot of us also are grieving. Perhaps it's about time for us to humbly come together to approach God and ha ask for His help to heal our family. As we see in today's passage, Romans 15, can we, can we uh, show that on screen? Romans 15, chapter 1 to 7, describes two different kinds of believers. There are strong believers and there are weak believers, some more mature than others, walking in bigger strides with God, living out more godly lives than others. In another passage, Paul also mentioned the differentiation within the church of Corinth among believers. There are those that are still infants in Christ, says 1 Corinthians 3.1. John as well talked about three categories of believers. There are children, young men, and fathers, as seen in 1 John chapter 2, 12 to 14, which pertains more to spiritual maturity rather than physical age. Pastor Steve Lawson said, believers are equally justified, but not equally sanctified. The point here is even among believers in a local church, we are all different. We're not, the same, we're not on the same page of our spiritual maturity. The person seated next to you is different from you. Believers are equally justified by the finished work of Christ on the cross, but not equally sanctified as God has carved out different journeys for each of us. The appeal in Romans 15, 1-7 is to strong believers is to strong believers, to live in unity with weak believers. We see here that God highly values unity in the church. Not only do we need one another, but we are fused together, attached to one another, side by side, arms locked in. Church, let's go back to the basics. What should a church be? What should a church look like? What should a healthy church look like? Preaching the word, praying and lifting up one another, speaking the truth in love, sharing what we have with one another, bearing with one another, reaching out to the lost together. Aren't we tired of all these arguments? Aren't we in need of real encouragement? We can rest knowing that all true comfort is from knowing God through His Word. He is our encouragement. He is our peace. He calls the church to be united, 
to be one with one another. Romans 15, 5 to 7 says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 7 says, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. How then could we not pursue unity when Christ himself has welcomed us into his family? We were once enemies of God, enslaved to sin, but praise be to God for his grace and his mercy, for his precious redemption for those he has chosen and called to himself. We did not do anything that would ever merit God's salvation for sinners like us. May verse 5 to 7 be our prayer. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant us to live in harmony with one another, in accord with Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, that together we may with one voice glorify the God and, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, church, GCFers, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. As we celebrate the 45th anniversary of our church, we are eager, more than eager, to dive into God's word and learn about the various one another verses that we see in the Bible. Forgiving one another, bearing with one another, encouraging one another, all the more as we see the day drawing near. But before we start that series next month, and as we finish the Clear the Series this weekend, today, it will be good for us to take a step back and consider if we, who belong to the local church called GCF Ortigas, do indeed dwell in unity. Are we dwelling in unity? Let's examine what the Bible says about genuine fellowship and in humility, commit to pursue being one with one another. May I now call on Pastor BJ again? Thank you, Pastor Chico. Oops. Let's pray about that. Keep your Bibles open to Romans 15. With all of that said, beloved, I will be brief. Nah, not really. <laughs> Just kidding. There's always the danger of division in church. We get divided over worship styles, musical styles, how loud the instrument should be. The kinds of hymns that we sing. We get divided about how sermons should be preached. What kind of sermon should be preached. Topical, expository. We get divided about church governance. About being Baptist or Presbyterian or Episcopalian or Congregational. Elder run. Elder rule. We get divided about who should be leaders in the church. We get divided about their personalities. Because we don't like some of them, some we like, some we don't like. We get divided about that. In 1 Corinthians 3, the church there in Corinth was divided into factions that are headed by their leaders. We get divided about politics. What color are you? Are you red? Are you yellow? Are you blue? We get divided about social issues. Are you vaccinated? Do you like wearing a mask? You notice I'm the only one who's wearing a mask. This is my Christian liberty. I have the liberty to wear a mask. It does not make me less Christian. It does not make me more Christian. It just makes me look fatter. 
We get divided about matters of Christian liberty and matters of moral indifference. We already get divided about sin and error. We can't get divided about things of moral indifference. That's what Paul is talking about starting in Romans 14 in this entire section. There's a pressing need for unity in the body. Psalm 133.1, one, we read earlier, already says that it is pleasant and good for brothers to be united. It's like the oil flowing through the beard of Aaron. It's like the Jew on the Mount of Hermon. It makes our lives worthy of the gospel. What Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Unity reflects the Godhead. We learned this in our series in Ephesians when we got to chapter 4. It starts with verse 1 saying, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all, and in all. Did you count how many ones there was in those verses? And how many alls? Unity reflects the unity of the Godhead. It's the picture of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. It says, For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body Though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. One. We are one. We are to be one with one another. So first in the first four verses of Romans 14, 15, we see the obligation. Later on, in verses 5 to 7, we will see the objective of the obligation. But first, the obligation. We see firstly the bearer of the obligation. Who bears this obligation? Verse 1, we who are strong have an obligation. Let's stop there. We have an obligation. Those who are strong. Who are those who are strong? Well, those who are strong. Spiritual or spirit-filled? Look at what Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, spirit-filled, spirit-controlled, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But for those who are strong, who are spiritual, there's a warning. Because you might think, oh, I'm strong. So now this is my responsibility. This is my obligation. Because I'm strong. But look at what verse 1 of Galatians 6 says. Keep watch on yourself. Lest you too be tempted. There's a solemn warning for those who think they're strong. Sometimes when you think you're strong, that's when you fall. Nobody knows that more than me. Sometimes we commit sin that creeps up on us because we think we're strong against it. But no, nobody's that strong. Yes, you can be strong and mature in the faith, but you have to keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted. The strong are those who are discerning. 1 Corinthians 2.15 The spiritual person judges all things discerns all things, but he is himself to be judged by no one. Those who are strong in the word, as Chico read from 1 John 2, 14, the young men in the congregation, they have overcome the evil one because they are strong in the word. Because that word is able to build us up, the man of God. 
to be mature. Those who understand their liberty in Christ. That's what this whole section is about. In Romans 14 too, Paul said, As for the one who is weak, sorry, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. By implication, the one is, who is strong is the one who believes that he can eat anything. For the Jews, those Jews who have become believers in Christ, who have been freed from the dietary laws of the Old Testament, they can eat anything. Anything, if everything is kosher to them. They are not afflicted in their conscience by eating certain kinds of food. In verse 5, Chapter 14, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So in other words, beloved, the Jews, the Jewish believers that Paul was addressing, they had been free. They understood that they had liberty in Jesus Christ. They understood that in Christ they were saved completely. That they have been liberated from the restrictions of the dietary and ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. But not from the moral law. They're not free to sin because they're slaves to Christ. But there were some Jewish believers who were still young in the faith. And they had not yet understood the whole concept of being free in Christ. And they were still offended when, when, they, had, when they ate something that was not kosher, that was not clean. According to the Old Testament law, they still esteem the days, the feast, the Passover, the Pentecost, the Feast of the Tabernacles. They still wanted to celebrate those, thinking that they were still required. But no, they had not understood yet. In the same way, there are believers today who are of a different political stripe than others. But your politics does not commend you to God any more than the other person. You can be read or yellow, it doesn't matter in the sight of God because there is no sin that's being committed. You are free. Also, there are those who think that medical directives against the coronavirus, that there are some who are divided about that issue. I obviously am, uh, am exercising my freedom to wear a mask because of the five comorbidities that will kill a person who has coronavirus. I have four. You know, I'm very competitive. <laughs> Four out of five. So I have to wear this mask. Beloved, that's Christian liberty. Those who are, under, who are strong understand that liberty extends to things of moral indifference. As long as you're not enslaved, 1 Corinthians 6.12 says... There Paul wrote, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. That's the restriction. He was talking there about sexual immorality. We are not to be dominated by our sexual cravings. As long as it helps build, build us up. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Paul said again, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. So if there are things that you do that don't build you up, you are free not to do them. If there are things that build you up, you are free to do them. We have liberty in Christ. As long as they are done from faith, Romans 14, 23. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So these are just three simple guidelines on how to exercise your Christian liberty. As long as you're not enslaved, as long as it builds you up, and as long as it's done from faith, then you are free. Now, the strong have a burden. They have an obligation. The word there literally means to be indebted, to owe a debt to someone, to be obligated, to have a financial obligation, a debt to pay. That word there is strong. And the strong are obligated. They have a debt to pay. They are committed and obligated to use their maturity in the faith to welcome those who are less mature. That's verse 1 of Romans 14, where it says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. 
Paul was addressing the strong, the mature in the faith. If you understand that you have liberty in Christ, then welcome those who are not quite there yet. That's what he's saying. That's our obligation. We are the bearers of that obligation, those of us who are strong. But be careful, lest you think you stand. Keep watch that you too might not be tempted. What's the burden of the obligation? Still in verse 1. You're wondering, oh, this is going to be long. He's still in verse 1. Okay. We have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. That's the burden. That's what we carry. The word for bear actually means carry, to put it on your shoulders. That's why in Galatians 6.2, Paul said, Continuing there, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? The law of Christ is love one another as I have loved you. That's in Deuteronomy 6. That's in John 13, 34 to 35. Bear one another's burden. Carry the weaker brother. It does not mean just bear him as in put up with him. No. It means you come alongside You come alongside that person. You carry him. You carry her. You be patient with them. So they don't get it yet. That what you eat does not commend you to the Lord. The days that you celebrate does not commend you to the Lord. Your politics or your medical preferences. They don't necessarily commend you to the Lord as a better person or not. They don't quite get that. And so they are offended sometimes. And so they don't want to come to church. They don't want to join your growth group, whatever. Be patient with them. That's what the word bear means. Failings is a similar word. It's a scruple of conscience. An infirmity or an error arising from a weakness of understanding. That's what failings mean. The weak have these failings. We have an obligation to help the weak, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. The idle, the faint-hearted, the weak, be patient with them all. We read Acts 20.35, it is better to give than to receive. We are to help the weak because there are some who are weak. They cannot support themselves. We need to give to them and share our blessings with them. There are those who are weak who cannot let go of their, of their material things in life. They're not yet approached that maturity, so we have to help them along their journey in life. Because it is blessed to give, to give of ourselves, to bear with one another. These are the weak. They're not yet mature enough to understand their Christian liberty. Because in Romans 14, they are offended by certain foods that are eaten. If they are Jews, they are offended because they still have this dietary loss uh, hanging over their heads. If they are Gentiles, they remember that in the past, in their Gentile life, some foods are offered to idols. But actually, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, In verse 8, it says, Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat or no better off if we do. So Paul was saying this is a matter of moral indifference. It does not matter in the final analysis. If it does not enslave you, if it builds you up, if it's done out of faith, then you are free in Christ. The weak are those who still don't get this. Now, You might be asking, Pastor, so we are to judge whether one is strong or whether one is weak. So are we allowed to judge? Yes. Some young people always tell me, oh, you judged me. Of course I judged you. The Bible allows us to judge. In the same passage that says, judge not that ye be not judged. Immediately after that, we are asked to discern whether we have a plank in our own eye, we are, whether we are guilty ourselves of being weak. That requires judgment. You're not supposed to throw your pearls to the swine. Now, the swine is not an image of me. 
It's just a metaphor in the Bible, okay? I'm not using that to depict me, but maybe I am a swine. But you don't throw your pearls to the swine. In order for you to, to identify who the swine are, then you have to judge. So we have to make judgments, beloved, but we do them. Remember in Galatians 6.1, keep watch that you may not too be tempted. Be careful lest you think you stand because then you will fall. There's a negative command here, still in verse 1, not to please ourselves. We are not to do anything out of selfish ambition, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Then he goes on, have this mind among you yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in very nature God. And, so, and he describes the amazing humiliation of the Lord, putting the Lord as the example for us who think of ourselves. We are not to please ourselves. We are not to despise the weaker brother in Romans 14. We are not to not welcome him into, into the fellowship. We are to be one with them, even in their weakness. Those who are more mature in their understanding of the faith should not use their maturity to please themselves or to have some kind of a holy huddle. No? Oh, we're the strong, we're the, we're, the, we're the macho Christians to the exclusion of the others. No, that's never the thing. In Philippians 2, Paul said, don't think of yourselves, think of others. Positively, there's a command. Now we're in verse 2. Wow, there's progress. Verse 2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Pleasing here is, is blessing the weaker brother, not making him superficially happy in order to solicit his praise. It's not the same as what Paul said in Colossians 3, 20, 22, where we are to be God pleasers and not men pleasers. No, that's not the same meaning. To please here is to grant the weaker brother the blessing of being edified. Or built up in the faith. He already said that in Romans 14, 19. Where he said, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding, edification. In Ephesians 4, 7, we are told that Christ gives us a measure of faith, a gift. In verses 11 to 13, he says that he gave apostles and prophets and, and evangelists and shepherd, teaching shepherds. Teaching shepherds. So that we might build up the saints to equip them to build up the rest of the church until we, we reach maturity in, in, the, in our walk with Christ. That's the objective. To please our neighbor for his good, to build him up. Those who have greater understanding of the faith should use that knowledge to lift up the maturity of those who have lesser knowledge and understanding. We're squeezing this text, you notice. Now we reach the reason for the obligation. Verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. That's a quotation from Psalm 69, verse 9. And that Psalm, Psalm 69, is one of the six messianic Psalms in the book of Psalms. And that Psalm describes the suffering and the sacrifice, the self-sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. So when Paul was saying Christ did not please himself, he did not only not please himself, he gave himself. He gave himself up. Mark 10, 14, he said, I came not to be served, but to offer my life as a ransom for many. In Galatians 1, 4, Paul describes our Lord as one who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. In Galatians 2.20, we have died to Christ because he gave himself up for us. Our Lord did not seek his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. In John 6.38, he said that. My joy is to do the will of the Father. In John 8.29, he said that, to obey the will of the one who sent me. In Luke 22.42, he said, not my will, but thine. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, 
but your will be done. He did not just not please himself, he gave himself up. That's our example. Our Lord so identified with the Father that the reproach that was meant for God fell on him. The animosity of the whole world against the Holy God fell on him on that cross. The ones who hated God hated him, and because they hated him, they will hate us. The reason why those who are more mature in faith owe it to their weaker brother to lift them up is because Christ humbled himself to lift us all up. So if you find it hard, for example, to tolerate or to be patient with your weaker brother, somebody who doesn't quite understand that politics or medical measures or eating food or doing this or that does not really commend us to God, those who still don't understand that, and who are somehow offended by some of the things that you do, that you do in liberty, then you have to restrict your liberty. And if you find it hard not to please yourself, but to please them and to bless them and to help them up, then just remember the cross. Just remember the cross. For there Christ took on the reproach of the whole world. Then we find a reminder of the obligation in verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So because he quoted a messianic psalm, Paul once again returns to this time-tested theme of his writings, of the inerrancy and the infallibility and the inspiration of the scriptures. He points back to the Old Testament as the source of our endurance and encouragement. He did that because he quoted a psalm. It is the obligation to bear up with a weaker brother. It's a heavy and burdensome task. And so we need endurance and we need encouragement. Where do we find it? The word for endurance means patient continuance. And in the Old Testament, we see pictures of that, wonderful examples of that. Job, for example, patient continuance. Moses in the wilderness, patient continuance. And of course, there are pictures of encouragement. The word is paraklesis, to come alongside, to comfort, to console, to find comfort and consolation. Do we find that in the Old Testament? Certainly, like David, when he was running away from Saul, he found his comfort in the Lord. Like Joseph, when he was imprisoned unfairly, he found his comfort in the Lord. Those are all Old Testament stories. So the sacred writings bring us encouragement and endurance because bearing up with one another is not easy and hard. And our patient continuance and our comfort and consolation from the scriptures. The scriptures remind us that the obligation of more mature believers to lift up the weaker brethren can be pursued with hope because we can have endurance, because when we can, when we can have encouragement, then we can find hope in the scriptures. Finally, we go to the objective of the obligation, verses 5 to 7. The objective of the obligation is expressed in the prayer and a prescription by the Apostle Paul. He says, the objective is so that we can live in harmony. That's in verse 5. You see, scripture and prayer are always the twin forces that transform believers from the inside out. Isn't that true? Amen? And after admonishing the strong with the word, he says, you go to the scriptures if you need strength to remain strong so that you can bear up with the weak. You go to the scriptures for encouragement, for endurance. After admonishing the strong with the word, Paul prays the same word will do its work in their hearts. So after he preached, he prayed. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. Paul's prayer is that the God who authored the scriptures, those scriptures that can bring you endurance and encouragement and therefore hope, the one who authored those scriptures, may he be the very one who he himself will give us exactly the patience and comfort that we need to pursue unity in the church, 
by bearing up with our weaker brethren towards spiritual maturity. It is God who wrote the scriptures. It is He who will grant us encouragement and endurance. It is both patience and comfort that we need in order to live in harmony with one another. It's so hard to, be, to have unity, right? It's so hard to be at peace with one another. Why? Because James chapter 4 says, you know, we all contend. We, we, we have these selfish desires. We all want to defend our rights. We all want to get what we, we feel we deserve. And so we contend. It's natural. But we are supernatural children of God. That is not to be the mark of our fellowship. It is a bane to our church if our church is divided. If we have these rifts that go unspoken in our midst. And you know, like Chico said, you're free to confront even us. If you find my sermons too long, you can confront me. But I will not listen to you. The second objective is so that we can glorify God in our unity. Verses 6 and 7. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That's what we live for. Whether you eat or you drink, do all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, you do in the name of Christ. We live for the glory of God. We were saved for the glory of God. We are sanctified for the glory of God. We will be glorified for the glory of God. Therefore, we can be one with one another for the glory of God. Paul's prayer continues with the end goal of living in harmony. With one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because living in harmony, in one accord, with the will of Christ will bring glory to our almighty God. Paul's prescription begins with, therefore. Because my prayer will be answered. Because when he prayed, may the God cause us to live in harmony. He knew that prayer will be answered. Because that prayer will be answered, he gave a command. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. That's what he said in the beginning of chapter 14. As for the weaker brother, welcome him. So the end result of the stronger among us, bearing up the weaker among us in love and unity is the glory of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, the church today is threatened by division because of reasons and matters that in the final analysis are not worth denying our God the glory that he deserves. Do these debates really amount to anything? Don't they just mar the glory of God in our midst? Can I hear an amen? It's too soft. Still too soft. Okay, that's it. You're not listening. Let those of us who are stronger, not with any kind of pride, beloved. I don't say that with any kind of, I'm strong and you're weak. No. Because that too can divide us. And if we were left to ourselves, even that we will allow to divide us. Oh, so you're strong and I'm weak. Beloved, that's not the point. The point is we have to bear up with those who are weaker so that with endurance and encouragement from the scriptures... And from the self-sacrificing example of our Lord Jesus Christ, we might all live in harmony for what? For the glory of God. Don't you think he deserves glory? Doesn't he deserve glory for saving us? Doesn't he deserve glory from saving us from before the foundation of the world? Doesn't he deserve glory for sanctifying us so that we might be like Christ? Then give him the glory. And welcome one another for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we are such fallen creatures. 
There is so much that divides us. And we ask your forgiveness because our division brings shame upon your name. When the world sees your church bickering with one another, we bring shame to your name. When we allow matters of moral indifference to part us from one another, we bring shame to your name. When we behave in such a manner that we do not love one another, sacrificially as you have loved us, we bring shame to your name. May that never be so in our church. May your name be glorified in us being one with one another. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor, and glory forever and ever. And all the people of God said, Amen. You've just heard a message from the Word with Green Hills Christian Fellowship Ortigas in partnership with Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines. We hope you can join us next week. God bless you.